I have a lot of introduction, but I'll try to keep it to a minimum. I've got 30 verses to go through today out of uh, the Gospel of uh, John, chapter 16. St. Peter, and uh, it's recorded in Acts, in his sermon, possibly his first sermon, uh, the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> he quotes from the prophet Job. Second chapter. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. <clears throat> Excuse me. And my manservants and my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. They shall show, uh, I, shall, I shall, will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth below or beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I know some of my uh, family's probably thinking, why are you acting like Uncle Ron? Uh, I don't know. Um, but I thought that was appropriate given uh, we're gonna have a uh, solar eclipse tomorrow and it's going to be a total solar eclipse uh, for the continent of North America, in particular the contiguous United States. And uh, the scripture here, although uh, kind of uh, expressing it in everyday language, is, is describing a solar eclipse and a uh, lunar eclipse, um, if we understand it correctly in, cha in uh, this uh, second chapter of Acts, but referring to uh, the prophecy given by jo uh, Joel. I might have said Job, but I meant Joel, sorry. Uh, uh, mental block. Verse 20 there. Uh, but interestingly enough, referring to the descent of the Holy Spirit and uh, the Comforter as it, as it is in the church age for us that we'll be going through this passage today as it's described. If you could, uh, I think I have to use this clicker. Where, where do I point? To the computer? I didn't do that, did I? No. <laughs> Let's see if I can practice here. The light's flashing, or maybe it's... Uh, Of, uh, is it that slow or are you pressing something? Okay. So I'll be, one other introductory comment, I'll be using a uh, translation that I've maybe encouraged here at the church in the past. It's called the New English Translation. And it's come about probably within the last 10 years or so. And it's actually uh, somewhat of a freeware version of the Bible. Uh, obviously, scholars, though, have, have uh, d um, performed the translation. And uh, it's abbreviated uh, uh, NET, N-E-T. And the unique thing about this translation um, although there's, you know, every translation has its own little unique features. This one actually comes with over 60,000 translator notes and comments. So for those of you, and I, I, I'm one of those, I don't know the original Greek, Koinonia Greek, or the original Hebrew. And so it's nice to see what the translators are thinking. And, uh, and, and maybe we'll, we'll click on some of those notes today to see how to use that version. And uh, so most of the uh, scripture I'll put up 
after we read through the full text will be from the net version. <coughs> Sorry, Joel. It's going to be some of that. So have you ever been in a situation where uh, your leader is leaving, maybe abruptly, and uh, whether it's at work or in the family, maybe it's a death in the family that's, that you know is imminent. Um, think about that situation. That's essentially what we have here with uh, Jesus as he has um, arranged during this Passover, which is a common Jewish uh, uh, holy day that's kept to uh, inform them, and he's probably given them signs and, and direct indication of this already, that uh, his time has come. Uh, thus, the, the, uh, the second part of the title that I, uh, that I um, uninspired here, hour, his hour has come. Uh, uh, John tends to use that um, when he's referring to uh, Jesus' time on Calvary. There's also an hour that's indicated in this passage of John 16 that also deals with our, our, our hour, hour of persecution and our hour of um, testimony. But uh, I've got some things that I recollect in my past of uh, of times where leaders have, um, in my own personal life, that I have lost. Uh, right now, my father's in the hospital. He's uh, he's had a stroke um, probably about two months ago. You know, he's um, as many fathers. You know, nobody's perfect, and he, he's definitely not been a perfect father. But um, he's. I don't think he'll, he'll recover from this. I think he's, uh, he's just moments away from his hour. So if, if, uh, maybe he's been, uh, his uh, prayer request has been on the uh, email chain. But if you would uh, consider, please uh, continue to pray for him. He's close now. I'm able to see him in the nursing home by the house. Um, but that's an example. I also have another example that's maybe a little more uh, lighthearted uh, that's not such a good example of leadership, but uh, as many of you know, I've, I've, I've trained uh, in the sciences, uh, physics in particular, also engineering, and I, I've uh, spent a lot of time in graduate work. And uh, I was, before I left Wayne State, I was in pursuit of a, uh, a PhD, which I did not complete, but uh, I completed all the coursework for it. And uh, I can remember one particular class where um, it is a full year requirement for all the graduate PhD candidates to take what's called classical electric electricity and magnetism. And uh, you might have gotten a flavor of that in undergraduate courses. But this was a whole year at the graduate level where you use you know, partial differential calculus and, and so forth to apply to physical law. And it's a difficult class. And everyone has to take it. And so you can imagine it was full. And for a graduate level, full means about 12 or 20 people. And, uh, and the professor Kuo was teaching. Um, uh, Chinese in descent, probably been here at least 20 or 30 years. Um, he had somewhat of a handle on English, as you, know, uh, you can imagine if you've had a foreign uh, professor teach uh, you know, any particular topic, in this case a technical topic. Um, but he was very engrossed in his research. I'm giving, I'm giving excuses of his uh, behavior. But 
one of the things that is commonly done the first day or so or week of, the, of uh, class is you get a syllabus. You know, and back in the day, this is 25 years ago, I, you know, you get a hard copy. Now they probably come electronic, but you got a hard copy of the syllabus, what was required of us, usually problems, and how many tests, and so on and so forth. And we look at the problem set, and yeah, you know, it's a standard book, it's, it's uh, author Jackson. Um, I don't know if they're still using it, but that book was probably 20 years old when I took it, so it was, it was, you know, it was a common textbook that every graduate student um, was familiar with. And it was a difficult textbook to understand, and the problems were difficult. And there were, were solu even back then, there were solutions to these problems on the internet and copies of them, but there were two or three or four different copies as they had different solutions. That's how difficult this, 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 this uh, text was. And, um, and he, as he uh, handed it out, he said, now, don't expect me to grade the homework. You have to do the homework, but don't expect me to grade it. I don't have time for that. And, uh, and yeah, that started an uproar in the class. What do you mean? We, we, we need to know the solutions, even, you know, it, and uh, that's when he went into a, you know, a little spiel about a discourse that, um, you know, he's, his time's too important. And, and by the way, he said to us, if you are coming here to learn the material, don't expect that. You're supposed to learn the material from the textbook and uh, doing the problems. And... Uh, so you can imagine that there's at least 50% of the people at that point. And I obviously questioned whether I should stay in the class, but I, I needed it. I couldn't waste, this is a whole year. It's only offered once. You can't take it with another professor. You gotta wait a whole year. And actually it was every other year that it was offered. So you had been there an extra two years. Well, I had a buddy that was in the class that was actually a, a medical doctor that came back to do physics uh, as a PhD Yvonne knows who I'm talking about, D David Bauer. And a uh, very bright guy, as you can imagine. And uh, he did not like this one bit. And he was very opinionated. You know, he's 10 years older than most of us, probably, because he's already got, uh, you know, a degree under his belt and work. He worked as a radiologist for many years. And uh, he went to see Quo afterwards, and he said, this isn't going to work, Dr. Quo, and gave him a number of reasons. Uh, but Quo wasn't going to budge. And uh, so David eventually made an arrangement with him that he, he took it uh, like as an independent study or redid it some other year. At, at, by that time, I, I, but I stayed in there. So I had to, you know, plug away. I think I was struggling with a B. And this is graduate, or graduate school, you usually don't get Bs. And, you, you know, it's, it's a completely different uh, um, grade structure back then. If you're serious about graduate work, you mostly get A's. I just, it was, it was terrible. And uh, obviously I was praying throughout it, but that's, that's not, <laughs> hopefully not the outcome of, you know, what, what I'm going to tell you was because of my prayers. But um, November comes around, the holidays, and we had uh, probably our second or third test, and uh, we take the test, and I think it was the day that we received that test back. I, I, he very rarely gave us solutions to the test either because the tests were basically the problems that we didn't have solutions for. <laughs> and uh, he's had a heart attack. So he's not even here. He's in the hospital. And, uh, and his, uh, well, he wasn't in the same group, but it was another uh, Chinese professor, Dr. Uh, Chang, was going to take over. Now, Chang was very, f far more methodological, and everybody was relieved by that, although, you know, Dr. Quo was in the hospital. We didn't know what was going to happen to him, but um, it was basically Chang. That was how I really passed the class, because I had a good two weeks of lecture after that, and then the finals right before Christmas, where, you know, I was able to you know, eke out a B in that, in that semester. I don't know how I made it through this, the second semester. And the reason why I say that is, um, Quo recovered. 
And in late January, he came back to, to basically finish. You know, his heart attack must not, I didn't go see him in the hospital. Some of the, some of the people that actually were under his wing in our class, obviously, they had to go see him in the hospital because, you know, that was, part, it was going to be on, his, on their Ph.D. committee, probably, Quo was. And, um, but he recovered. Uh, I could give you other examples. I'll give you one other example that's maybe uh, a better example of leadership. If I can find it in the slides here. Washington's farewell address to the nation. I've got this, this Bible here that kind of focuses on uh, patriotic things of the United States. And I have uh, some words from uh, <coughs> President George Washington and what he had to say before he left office. Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indis indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. These firmest props of the duties of men and citizens, the mere politician equally with the pious man ought to respect and cherish them. A volume could not trace all their connections with private and public felicity. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oath, which are the oaths, which are the instruments of investigation in courts and justice, courts of justice. And let us with caution indulge the, the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on the minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience, both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. It is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of proper government. The rule, indeed, extends with more or less force to every species of free government. Who that is a sincere friend to it can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric. So Washington feared our country would lose its pillars of virtue that is morality and religion that, that uh, supports morality. And likewise, we have a similar request from Jesus, a warning. But then we also have a helper. Let's go to the scripture now. These are my observations. We'll talk about those after. I guess it's not big enough, is it? I apologize. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn to chapter 16 of John, We'll be reading all the way to the end of John from, from verse 4. If I remember correctly, Pastor Matt did read up to John 4, uh, part A. And I think all of 4 is here in the text I have, if you can see it. I can't see that one from there. Maybe the first couple of rows can see it here. This is in the NIV. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going 
to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I say to you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. I have it in a couple of slides. We basically have split it up into three sections. I always keep forgetting which button to press in order to go forward, but I think that's it. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more? Then after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know understand what he, he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. Key point, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a baby is born into the world. So with you now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you, away from you. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. And then finally, for the last part of this chapter, verses 25 to the end, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. And that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus Disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe? Or some versions say, and now you believe at last. Jesus replied, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Or tribulation is also another 
way to translate that. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Yep, Pastor Matt gave me all these verses, so. <clears throat> when I told him that like a couple weeks ago and I sent him my notes, he said, yeah, you know, I, th I think I gave you too much. <laughs> yep, <laughs> he may never ask me to do this again. <laughs> Observations. Let's see if I can go back to that with my clicker. Pressing, the, I'm focused on the wrong. Here we are. So as you saw from the image that I had downloaded off the internet, and uh, maybe inappropriately I didn't uh, give uh, credence and uh, reference to where that came from, I really don't know. These days you, you click uh, in, on Google and you search images and things just pop up, right? Some inappropriate as well if you go down far enough. And, uh, but uh, maybe I can, well, we'll, we'll go back to that some other time. But, but what's going on? You know, uh, maybe it was a year ago or so, either Don came across it first or I came across it, but uh, there was this, uh, this uh, webinar type uh, Bible study that was uh, distributed by, I think it was Dallas uh, Theological Seminary that was uh, learn how to study the Bible like a, um, a theologian or a, uh, a uh, um, seminary student. And, uh, but it was actually very basic. Clicked it too far. And so I thought we would begin by looking at some of the observations. I am going the wrong way. Should have practiced the clicker, huh? So who, who do we have in, in, in this text? We've got Jesus and the disciples. And it turns out that we're, we're back, actually still in the same setting we were from the previous few chapters, probably starting, where, I can't remember, but it was maybe 13 where uh, Jesus uh, um, is maybe the beginning of the setting. Uh, they're in the upper room, and Jesus is washing the uh, disciples' feet. We also think that what happened here, based on this, the other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, that uh, we have the Last Supper um, and uh, communion uh, by Jesus, where he, um, he uh, describes uh, how his death and resurrection is going to take place and uh, through the, the bread and the cup, and uh, tells us to do this in remembrance of him. And so here we are, we're still at the table. Think about that maybe in your own personal lives, in your family life, where um, at least for many of us, that's maybe a, um, a good time to remember where you know the food's been eaten and uh, everybody's just talking around the table, lingering on. And that's what's happening here. Jesus is lingering and talking and sharing with his disciples. And Jesus knows that this is it. The disciples maybe still aren't sure that what's going on, but Jesus is sure. And, uh, and what's he doing? He's warning them. You know, uh, re reminiscent to the warnings that uh, George Washington gave in his farewell address of, of uh, what he has, has built up and uh, what he has prepared, but yet um, obviously Jesus has an advocate in the Godhead. He has the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is introduced in the verse where it's been translated in this version. I just clicked something I wasn't supposed to. Uh, advocate in, in, in verse 7. So if we go to... Well, Let's finish uh, the observations, though, first. We'll go to that, verse 7. And uh, we already talked about where. It's in the upper room. And uh, it's Holy Thursday. It's the Passover. Friday is the um, preparation of, um, of the day of Passover, the Sabbath on Saturday. 
And uh, well, the Passover is actually Thursday night, but uh, preparation for the for the Sabbath on Saturday, and uh, and why. Uh, Jesus is uh, is expressing love to to his disciples, and uh, and also encouraging them um, that they're not going to be left alone. And you even see that in in this Trinity at play, right? That's why we call the Godhead a Trinity. That Jesus finds encouragement and and uh, um, <clears throat> uh, help in the Father, and. Uh, and then Jesus bestows those um, things onto the Spirit, who then lives in us as the church. And uh, that's how they work. They work hand in hand. Um, this reminds me, and maybe you too, uh, we recently reviewed and went through uh, the Truth Project with uh, Dr. Tackett and uh, how he has this peculiar um, um, Ability to see uh, the things of this world in threes, and uh, particularly here, as it um, as it is the image of the Godhead Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and then, well, if we know all these questions, all the answers to the questions. Well, what what, what is in it for me? I guess is a selfish way to say it. Or what is the application? We'll, we'll get to that. Hopefully. I've got about 15 minutes maybe. Let's go to the first section of the text. I, I broke it into three parts. If I put the clicker over here, I'll be more inclined to shoot at the computer. And this first part... I think we can call the, uh, and many Bibles do break this chapter into three sections, and they have their little uninspired titles in each, and this one's called maybe the work of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It, it turns out that this is, in John, this is not the first time that the word that's translated, advocate, is used in verse 7. It's... Um, it actually first appears in chapter 14. Um, I believe uh, Pastor Matt spoke on chapter 14. And uh, if you go there, I think it's verse 16. And other translations throughout the, the centuries may not have used this word advocate. And so in, in, in this version, the NET the uh, translators actually, for the first time that it's mentioned in John, paraclete is the, is the term. Uh, it's also in the title. I don't have the title up there anymore. Uh, comes from the root word uh, in Greek, paraclesis. And it means, and I think Pastor Matt also said this last time and maybe two weeks ago, that the meaning of that word literally means a calling out. Um, or a calling um, alongside, really. Uh, the klesis part of it is the calling. And para, maybe if you know Spanish or Latin, there's, uh, but obviously this is Greek, but uh, uh, alongside, that it's, it's referring to someone that's coming alongside. And in the past, I think maybe... Um, the King James might have uh, translated comforter, and uh, others' uh, translations have maybe used the word helper, and uh, even others might have used the word counselor. The uh, translators here go into some detail and suggest that, you know, some of these words have connotations because of the, the, the way, um, you know, definitions evolve, if you will. And uh, the advocate seemed to be the one that fit the best because helper kind of uh, or uh, assistant is kind of could possibly mean that it's um, it is um, not on the equal par as uh, who the, the person is helping, maybe a subordinate. And uh, counselor 
is maybe has connotations today that uh, um, because we, you know, we use that word in everyday language for uh, camp counselor and marriage counselor and, you know, these, uh, these uh, advocates that we have in, in society. Um, but they, they chose the word advocate, even though it may have some drawbacks. <clears throat> and he's coming. And Jesus summarizes his work in, in these three words, right? Sin, he's coming to convict or prove. Is the word used here? It also means to convict um, the world of their sin, of the world uh, of righteousness, and uh, of judgment. <clears throat> and interestingly here, he says sin is primarily because the people do not believe in me. Now that's not uh, to, to give less emphasis to the sins that we deal with on a regular basis. But that is to draw our attention to Jesus. Jesus is the answer to our sin. And particularly, the, the sin, if you will, um, defined elsewhere in Scripture against the Holy Spirit is to not believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and, and the work that he's done on the cross to, to, um, to take away our sin. <clears throat> and about righteousness, that he's going to the Father, that he, he is the one that, that holds the keys, right? He is blameless. He is the Lamb of God that can take away the sins of the world. And then finally, his work on Calvary, whether or not Satan understands that, and that's who we're talking about, the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. But that's also not a drawback to the smaller rulers of this world, who, if they do not accept Jesus, are basically accepting the rule of Satan on, in this world. So he's referring to the judgment of Satan by the work that he's going to go to on Calvary's Hill. Let's, let's move on to the second portion of the scripture where Jesus now makes a, uh, a slight transition and focuses on um, the disciples, really, right? I mean, he he's obviously was already interested in what the disciples were doing and thinking and whether they were understanding. But he can clearly see now that they're not understanding. Um, the first section, although I kind of overlooked it, but we read through it, and you probably got the gist. They're grieving. They're not grieving because they think Jesus is going to be put to death. They're grieving because he's told them they're going to be persecuted. They're worried about themselves. Now, we have, I have a tendency, maybe you do too, I read the scripture and, you know, patriarchs in the Bible and other famous Bible characters, you know, stick out in scripture, especially those that do what God wants them to do. And I think, wow, those people are special. Those people are super men and women. Wrong. Those men and women are sitting in the pews right here. We have the ability, if we, if, if we relinquish our will to the will of God through his spirit, we have the ability to be a patriarch, a matriarch, as the Bible says. Sure, you can look at, you can look at these people, their lives, you know, Noah it wasn't perfect, and, and, and Moses, and so on and so forth. 
But we, we have the potential. God has given us, and even more so, because he's given us a portion of the Godhead to dwell with us, the Holy Spirit. So the disciples are puzzled, you know. We have two, three, four, maybe five verses where they just continue to babble on. Well, what's he talking about? I, I, can't, I don't understand it. He's leaving, he's coming, he's going. He's, and, 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 and Jesus says, look, right? Like he always does. He, he, he goes into a figure of speech. He goes into a, a parable to help us dense people to understand. He uses earthly things to help us understand heavenly things. And he talks about the childbirth process. Now, for some of you here in, in the congregation, that's very particular, right? We have pregnant women here today. I don't think we have anyone that has, it's having their first child, though, right? We don't have anyone that's having their first child. Well, let me tell you a little story about Yvonne and I having our first child. Obviously, she had the child. I was the uh, cheerleader. Um, it, it is a scary time because you don't know what to expect. You know, you hear all the stories. You do all the Lamaze classes. You, she's got a child growing in her internal organs. And uh, on the top of it, she's so small, you know, you've, you've all seen my wife. Um, and she got sick, you know. The, Isaac probably wasn't the worst uh, to carry. Uh, we won't talk about the others. <laughs> but but we, we were just, you know, we were just winging it, you know. We're probably still winging it, but... But uh, we get to about week 34, and we had scheduled uh, after Lamaze to uh, go to tour the hospital so things would be more comfortable for us, you know, and, and, uh, and we would know what to do, kind of like figuring out this clicker before you're supposed to use it. <laughs> and it was, and at this time, she was working a 10-hour shift. She, was, she had Fridays off, and, uh, and that's so she could help uh, my mother-in-law, her mom, because her mom was still living with us here. And, uh, and then just to get some rest, you know. And so we get done with the 10 hour shift and I pick her up and we go to uh, Beaumont and we tour the Beaumont and that must have took an hour or two. And, um, and she's tired. Oh, but actually right before that, we went and had Thai food, you know, perfect thing to have when you're pregnant, Thai food. <laughs> And yeah, so I think by the end of the night, she's feeling uncomfortable. She thinks it's indigestion or whatever. And we go to bed and, what was it, 2 o'clock in the morning? She wakes me up. I don't know. Uh, you know, we had, you know she had the false, uh, the false labor pains, uh, whatever you call those. And, but uh, she said, no, this is not false labor. This doesn't feel right, Joe. We need to do something. <laughs> <laughs> we call the doctor. Go right to the hospital. You know, we just toured the hospital. We weren't supposed to go back to the hospital for six weeks. <clears throat> yep, sure enough, Isaac's coming. And, uh, and uh, you know, we were terrified. She was terrified, right? She didn't, she thought, you know, they, when we did the ultrasound, when we got there, the, you know, they said the baby was under five pounds, and oh no, we thought it's not big enough, and this and that, and, but um, God answers prayer. And uh, although Isaac had to stay in the hospital for 10 days, and he, he was barely over five pounds, but throughout those 10 days, he lost you know, probably almost a pound. He had some, some complications. His lungs weren't fully developed, but, but uh, there, there were worse babies in, that, you know, in, the, in, in the intensive care than, uh, in conditions than Isaac was in. And it was kind of just like a little resort for little babies. It was cool. You know, you go in there and they got them all in little, little glass tubs and, and uh, some of them got their purple lights on and their sunglasses. <laughs> 
And that was the joy, right? The baby's, uh, the baby's here. You know, all that pain and, and worry and d disappeared because now the baby's here. And, uh, you know, although there's issues um, that, uh, you know, we, we can pray and, and we can start to take care of them. And that's what Jesus is saying here to the, to the disciples. You will have joy. You will have joy because I am going to be resurrected. Uh, you know, they, they start, they're starting to believe. And then we get that in the last part. That they actually confess that now they believe. Now, <laughs> they maybe uh, are a little overconfident. And we see that, you know, in some of the apostles. Again, remember, these guys are just like us. You know, there's some that talk a lot. There's some that don't talk a lot. There's some that, that are a little too proud and some that are a little too, you know, quiet and don't have any self-confidence. You know, like think of Peter. Peter was, you know, a guy that was kind of all self-confident all the time and said things that, you know, he regretted. And it um, doesn't say who said that, but there in verse 29, did I get there yet? I did get there. Uh, Now you are speaking clearly without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things. You know? And they're like, well, we don't even have to ask you this question. We know we, we, that you come from God and you're going back to God. And, uh, and Jesus says, yeah, okay. You believe. But now believe what I just told you. That the Holy Spirit is coming and he is going to help you. But keep in mind that this is not going to be painless. This is not going to be painless. But you will overcome. Why are you going to overcome? Because I have overcome. I have overcome for you on the cross. And I am overcoming with you. And in, 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 um, in, again, in you relinquishing your will for the Spirit's will. Okay, I'm, I'm going to close here, but I guess I want to emphasize that. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but I'll do it this way. Reminds me of Mark's uh, um, conclusion of his sermon. And I'm going to get personal. I'm going to get personal about my own life. And you guys have an impression of me just like, you know, we have an impression of Bible characters and so on and so forth, some good, some bad. And, uh, but we all struggle with things. And the thing that I struggle with, that I'm going to show, uh, to present as an example, is uh, anger. Remember that list that, uh, that uh, we read out of Galatians, that Mark read for us earlier today about things that are not of the Spirit? And uh, anger and rage was one of those. Um, maybe you can relate. I, I've had moments in my life that anger is, um, has dominated my actions. Uh, we lived in a, in a small, uh, people like to call it a trailer, trailer, a um, manufactured home when we first got married. And uh, I got mad so much one time I had punched a hole in the wall. Um, not, not proud of it. Um, when the kids were small, we were all sitting around the table, just like Jesus sitting around the table with his disciples, it's after dinner, and uh, something comes up, it, it uh, disappoints me, makes me mad. I bang down on the table, and uh, Table, we had uh, glass tops. We bought some extra glass tops for the table to keep them, uh, keep them from kids writing onto the, the wood, uh, in, you know, engraving in the wood on the table and stuff. Broke the glass. I'm not proud of it. My kids, my kids have seen me in those fits of rage. Unacceptable. That's where we have to, and that's where I need to. Turn to God in those moments 
But you prepare for it. You prepare by being in the scripture, by, um, by, by those scriptural verses and, and, and those thought processes being um, first nature in your mind. And, and even more recently, uh, I need to confess something to the church that um, my fits of anger got to me again. Now, maybe not so much that I broke something or whatever, but, uh, um, and probably only a couple of members of the church saw, saw me um, get angry, and, um, but I want to apologize for that. Um, we were at the softball game. It was our last softball game. Eric was there, I think, still. It was late. I was ready to go home. In fact, I wanted to go home. But um, if any of you have met the organizer of this church league, um, he can get on your nerves. At least he gets on my nerves. And uh, he did something. He didn't, he didn't believe my word is what he did. And it, it really irked me. And... Uh, I, 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 I reacted inappropriately. So, I think with that, let's, let's, let's close in prayer. And church, yield to the Spirit. Learn to yield to the Spirit. 